Good morning. Welcome to River Church. Go ahead and, go ahead and be seated. And uh, I, want, I want you to know that uh, the, 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 the church in Alaska that I went and spent, spent some time with uh, last week, helping them and leading them, uh, they, they send you their greetings. Uh, the, 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 the two, they do have, they don't have a pastor, but they do have two um, elders, unpaid elders. Uh, and they both, they both wanted me to, uh, they, they, they both made it really clear, like, say thank you to River Church. Tell them that in you sharing me with them, I think that's how that goes, you sharing me with them, uh, it, it's been a blessing to them. And so they send you their greetings, and I think they're going to send a video sometime this week. You may, uh, next Sunday, you'll get to see a little video of what's going on in, in Juneau, Alaska, and kind of what, what I'm doing there, and, and maybe you'll get a, a better taste. I want, over the course of this next year, I want you to feel very much like you're sharing, uh, partnering with me as I, as, I, as I pour into this church plant in Juneau, and I want them to very much feel like they're getting to know you and, and uh, as, we, as we do the, the work of planting churches, not just here, but, but abroad and in Juneau. So anyway, uh, it was a good time. Uh, I, I got to go out on a boat and do a little fishing uh, in the dead of winter. Uh, in super deep water, because that's just how the water is there. And if you've ever seen this on TV, I didn't. I don't even. I don't even have a vocabulary for this. But uh, crab pots or crab rings. You drop these things, and you come back later, and you pick them up, and lo and behold, they're king crab in these in these pots. And so I get to do some of that, and we got to troll, unsuccessfully troll for some fish. Uh, I, I felt very ignorant. You know, I'm a I'm an angler. I'm a I'm a waterman, but I just felt so ignorant. It, uh, up there, uh, playing around in, in, in that cold water, but it was it was a good it was refreshing to my soul just to be able to do something new and, and something adventurous. Uh, and I came back on Monday, came back tired, really missing my sweetheart, really missing Lydia, and really missing the boys. And so I've been I've been back for about about a week now. We had a good uh, time at the uh, the celebration of Ron Wood's life yesterday. If you were here, thank you for coming. If you weren't able to make it, you might reach out to Sally. Um, send her a note or give her a call and just tell her you love her and, and you're praying for her as, during this time in which she's continuing to get used to not having her husband of you know, her entire lifetime here anymore. So she's going to stay home today and rest, but it was a good day yesterday. I'm ready to jump back into Matthew. Let me pray for us and we'll do that. You're a good God. You are a good God. <clears throat> we've, come here to, we've come here today because we believe that it is the best place for us to be, not because we feel obligated, uh, not mostly, and not because uh, not, we're not here out of, out of guilt, not mostly. Uh, m- mostly we're here because we just believe that this is, this, this is, this is a good place to be and, and that, that in you we'll find life, God. And so we ask you to Speak deeply into our souls today through your word. We thank you for your word. We, we ask that you would speak deeply into our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. Requests have been made. People have asked. I've even prayed. You've probably prayed something like, Oh God, that I might see you, might know you more. Righteous requests have been made throughout history, but no one has ever seen God. Moses wanted to see God. And God told him, I'll put you in the cleft, in the the little crevice of a rock, and I will put my hand over the crevice, and I will walk past you, and you will see see me as I I retreat. But but he says, no one can see God no one, seen, no one can see God and live. That's what the God of the Bible has told us throughout history. No one can look on God's glory and live. And yet, <clears throat> and yet, God in the form of Jesus Christ came to earth to make known to us who God is. John chapter 1, we're studying the the book of Matthew today, but John chapter 1 says this, 
No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made God known. So this means that, that if we want to know God, we can look to Jesus. If we want to, to see an appearance of what God is like, but Jesus came to earth to give us a picture of God. So it is good for us to hang on, to, to lean into the, the actions, the attributes, the attitudes, the relational nature of Jesus. It's important for us to study Jesus because He is for us the picture of God that we've been looking for. With that in mind, let us read again today the stories of Jesus and let us see God in Jesus. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Two stories. The fancy word is pericopes. Pericope number one and pericope number two just means story. Two stories from Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Then he, he is Jesus, then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. <clears throat> Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him. They woke him saying, Lord, save us. Lord, we are going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up because he had been awakened. He, he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. And it was completely calm. There's something about to back. Um, can, you, can you hear that? Maybe just um, delete all the... Still, just delete everything but my voice. And if it's still going on, then we're going to turn off the. Uh... Because when it greens, great will be the ring of it, I promise you. Okay. Am I on, though? Am I still there? Okay. I'm just not in the monitors, right? I guess that's what changed. All right. Put me, can you put me back, me back in the monitors, or can you not do that? If not, that's okay. There we go. All right. Thank you. He replied to the, the, fearful, the fearful disciples in verse 26. Go back to 26, if you will. You have little faith, why are you so afraid? And then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed, and they asked, What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And then story number two. When he arrived at the other side, that being the other side of Lake Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> the freshwater lake, which we will talk about in just a moment. When he arrived at the other side, in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. Two demon-possessed men met him. <clears throat> they were violent, or they were so violent, that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, Son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us 
before the appointed time, some distance from them a large herd of pigs was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. <clears throat> so he said to them, go. So they came out of the men, and they went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and died in the water, the pigs. <clears throat> Those tending the pigs ran off, went into town, and reported all this, including <laughs> what happened to the demon-possessed men. <clears throat> Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, the whole town, when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Today what we're going to talk about is calming the storms of life. And the authority of Jesus. <clears throat> okay, story, story number one is this. They are in a fishing boat. They are fishermen. A number of Jesus' disciples had been called out of the fishing industry to follow him as their rabbi. They're in a fishing boat. The fishing boat in that day would have been big enough to hold a dozen or more men and a good catch of fish because it was a fishing boat and it most likely didn't have a sail. <clears throat> They're on this lake which goes by a number of, 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 of names, uh, the Sea of Galilee, Lake Galilee, Lake Tiberias, uh, la the Lake of Gennesaret. There's several other names as well. This was the lake, this was the large body of fresh water that Jesus grew up on or grew, grew up near, because he, was from, he grew up in Nazareth, it was also the lake in which all these men, many of them, had fished commercially. They knew these waters well. They knew this boat well. This lake, this may or may not, may not mean anything to you, but this lake, while it was only 13 miles long, which is it's not that, it's, uh, that's like the distance of, of the inhabited part of South Padre Island, not the entire island, just the, just the inhabited part. While it was a, a relatively short lake, the, the, the water ran in, uh, entered north, and, and, and exited south. While it was a relatively small lake, it was 141, that's the, that's the recording, the 100, 141 feet deep. That is deep, that is deep water. If you go out into the Laguna Madre, the, 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 the bay, it's like this deep. And, and, and the Sea of Galilee is 140. It's very deep. It, it's like the water that I was on when I was in Alaska. It's very deep. It would have been very cold. And do you remember why the boat is crossing the lake? Uh, you may or may not remember this, but, but in last week when you read verse 18, Jesus gave orders. He said this. This is last week's passage. In verse 18, Jesus said, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Honestly, what's going on here is that Jesus needs some rest. He gets into the boat. <laughs> he's, he's, for the moment, he is saying, I've got to get away from the people because I need some rest. He gets into the boat. This, this boat ride would have only been like an hour, hour and a half or two hour ride. And he's already asleep. This is, this is an exhausted Jesus. It was common in that day. These men would have known this. It was common in that day for violent storms to whip up on this lake. One of the reasons is while the lake is, is 141 feet deep, it's also, um, if you understand topography, it is also 600 feet below sea level. Okay, so we have sea level 
And then this, this inland lake is 600 feet below sea level. So hot air would, would rise or fall or cold air would rise or fall. However, it happens and these violent shifts would take place. And so the lake to this day is notorious for these violent wind-driven storms. The air is churned up. The water is churned up. If you've been on the water enough times, you know how small that makes you feel. Storms make you feel powerless and insignificant. And so the disciples cry out. It's not the same word as, say, as, as Hosanna, which we, which we sang earlier today. It's a different form. Different, it's a different, sozo is the, basically the word. But they, they cry out, save us. Lord, save us. That's a good cry. We sang a different, different word, but we cried, we sang Hosanna, Lord, save us today. That is a good prayer. That is a righteous prayer. Lord, save us. You are our hope. Jesus in this story did not chide them for their concerned prayers, but rather their faithless fears. Praying and fearing are at odds with one another. I think you know that. I know it too well. At war in my heart is, is a concerned prayer and a faithless fear. Let me say that again. It, at war in my own heart. All too often, the war between the concerned prayer and the faithless fear. And often we give in. We choose worry over prayer. And so they are, according to Jesus' response, they, the disciples, are convinced apparently that they are going to drown. Again, your concerned prayers are not an affront to Jesus. Your faithless fears are. How do we know the difference? It's hard to know the difference at times, perhaps. Perhaps. It may be hard to, to, to determine, is my heart in a spirit of prayer or a spirit of fear? Because maybe it's subjective, maybe it feels subjective, but I will say this, when I, when I get on my knees or, or I go to my praying chair, I am taking a posture physically that warrants a concerned prayer. But when I stomp around the house and I consume too, too much caffeine and I work on the problem, over and over again, and I look for the answer by googling the question, I am taking a posture with my life that warrants faith, faithless worry. And Jesus does not chide our concerned prayers. He chides our faithless fears. As a parent, you know what it's like. You have regular opportunities to offer your concerned prayers. As an apparent, as a parent of adult children, even more so, like on steroids, you know how often you have the opportunity to pray concerned prayers, or we can live in our faithless fears. And Jesus says, his response. He says, O oh, you of little faith. How sad that must, hear to, must be to hear Jesus say that. The original language, the exact wording that Jesus chooses here only occurs five times in the New Testament. I tell you that not to impress you. I tell you that to say that, 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 that this is a rather unique um, sort of indictment that Jesus makes that is probably an, indi an indictment that is meant for those of us who would say, 
I've been following Jesus for a long time. Uh, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I, 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 there's a maturity to my faith. And for, for a person who would say there's a maturity to my faith, Jesus would use this phrase, this indictment, oh, you have little faith in this scenario. I think Jesus would reserve it for that. I don't think this would be a, uh, you know, a, uh, the shotgun blast or shot that he would take at someone who is just new in their faith and just, just beginning to be drawn to Jesus by the Lord. And, and there's, there's, a, there's not a seasoned maturity to that person's faith. I think Jesus reserves this. He only uses it five times in the New Testament. Or it's only used five times. And it references <clears throat> every time it's used, Jesus' disciples. The, the, my point is this. The frustration seems to be centered on the idea that these disciples should have by now um, been men of deeper faith. Yet they are struggling with the rudimentary. And why, why should they be men of deeper faith? I mean, they didn't have the New Testament. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have the, re, the, 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 the resurrected Jesus yet. So I'm going to cut them a lot of slack for that. But why did Jesus expect them to be men of faith, seasoned men of faith at this point? Here's why. Because just a few verses earlier, the previous story... In fact, verse 16, it tells us that Jesus, before he got onto the boat because he needed rest, Jesus had gone about healing everyone who came to him sick. Think on that for a moment. He's just there before he gets on the boat, before he's so exhausted that he passes out in this, in this 12-man uh, uh, fishing boat. But the, the, the prior day, he'd been there, and they would, everybody that they would bring to him, he would heal. And everybody that they would bring to him, he would heal that person too. And he was healing, and he was making whole, because Jesus wants for you healing. He wants for you wholeness. He goes to bed, he tries to get a, an hour's rest. They wake, they wake him up freaked out, and he says, you men of little faith. And so, so sometimes I feel that way. Like I've been following Jesus for so long. And I've seen His faithfulness in, in, in so many ways. Some of you have as well. So why do I still wrestle with the rudimentary elements of my faith? <clears throat> They believed, they believed that the, circumstance, that the circumstances were out of control and Jesus himself was merely a pawn in the game of chance. Do we wrestle with that same lie? Yes. My circumstances are out of control and Jesus is good and loving. He's here with me in the boat. But even Jesus is merely a pawn in this game of chance. I love Jesus. He's a sweet guy. But the circumstances are out of control. Faith is at war with fear. Fear is at war with faith. And Jesus is, point, is disappointed because in this moment, and they would have their better days, and so will we for eternity, but, but Jesus was disappointed because on that day the disciples chose fear. But the emphasis in this story, even though I've spent a lot of time on it, the emphasis on this story should not be their lack of faith. The emphasis on this story, number one, should be Jesus' power over nature. If you believe that the stories of the gospel are true, 
Jesus' power over nature. And their response to his miracle, when they saw that he really did have power over nature, their response to his miracle, what kind of man is this? They, they, were, they were amazed. They were shocked. Little faith. Little faith. Men of little faith. Women of little faith. Randy, at times, person of little faith. What that actually means is that they were unable at this point to see beyond the surface of things. And I too, I too am at times unable to see beyond the surface of things. We'll, 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 we'll come back to that. Last thing I want to say about story number one, and then we'll jump into story number two, is this. There is such a juxtaposition, a contrast. There is such a contrast between Jesus with human limitations, because he is the God-man, with human limitations, meaning he needed sleep, <clears throat> and Jesus with the authority of God, meaning he's the master of the storm. It is so intriguing to me that Jesus is asleep, exhausted, passed out. He needs his rest. But it's also Jesus who wakes up and commands all of creation. That's Jesus. Story number two. Two demon-possessed men. Do you, do you, I mean, I, none of us fully understand what that means. But, but two demon-possessed men. You, you've heard of that before. Where the, 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 the power of the demonic world is controlling this unbeliever, this person. This non-Christian. Two demon-possessed men, <clears throat> it says that they were so violent that no one could pass that way. Think on that for a moment. Like, this territory is ours. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't fear very many dogs. I'm pretty good with dogs. I'm like real good with dogs. But I'm just going to tell you, there are two dogs. I'm not even going to tell you what they are. But there are two Rottweilers are one of them. Uh, two types of dogs that I, like, I don't mess with. And the Rottweiler is one of them. They're, they're really good dogs. But when they're, when they're spun up, I don't go into their yard. Okay? I don't go into their territory. They're good dogs. But when they get spun up, I'm not going into their yard. I'll go into any other dog's yard, but not their yard. And one other dog, the husky. Uh, I won't go into their yard. <clears throat> they own that territory. Right? Okay, that's the deal here. It says that these demons, these demon-possessed men were so violent that no one could pass that way. But Jesus walks right up to them. He goes right up their space. And they come at him. And he doesn't flinch. This is how I like to picture Jesus. Bold. Not intimidated by, by danger. He, he, was, he was gentle, and yet he was bold. He was tough, he was tender. So these men are existing in um, some sort of <clears throat> cave, a uh, caved shoreline on the lake and it's some sort of an ancient graveyard and it's because of the, the, the nooks and the crannies and the, the cave. There's, it's a favorable environment uh, for them to, to get out of the weather uh, because it's this ancient graveyard. It's apparently a, an, a favorable environment for, for demonic activity in this, this region outside. So the caves apparently provides some kind of protection for the two men from the weather, but, but no protection from the demons. And the presence of pigs leads us to conclude that this was not a Jewish village. It was a Gentile village, or at least predominantly Gentile territory. And that's where Jesus goes. Jesus had withdrawn from the crowds. We've, we've, we've covered that. He'd withdrawn from the crowds, seeking rest. And yet after getting a little bit of rest on the boat, <laughs> it's like he's ready to go. This is where he lands. This is where he chooses to go. 
He chooses to take time to care for two demon-possessed dudes. That's what Jesus was on a mission to accomplish. <clears throat> the disciples who accompanied Jesus in this boat struggled with the question, who is this Jesus? But the demons, t there was no doubt in their mind. The demons with dark spiritual insight know in a flash who Jesus is. There is no question. What do you want with us, Son of God? Is their first response. And then the question is begged, why do the demons want to go into the pigs? Don't answer out loud, but think on that. Why do the demons want to go into the pigs? And I would say perhaps, perhaps because they want to rage and they want to stir up strife and they want to, to stir up strife in the village regarding Jesus. You see, Satan is always wanting to stir up strife in your life. Jesus is always stirring the pot in your life. I'm sorry. Satan is always stirring the pot in your life. Satan is always stirring up strife. Satan is always wanting to bring chaos into the order of your life and this world. Satan is about stealing and killing and destroying all that is precious to you. Why did the demons want to go into the pigs? I believe because they wanted to stir up strife regarding Jesus. So, so Jesus is master over nature in the storm on the boat. And now Jesus is master over all creation, even in the death of the pigs. Because Jesus cares about all of creation. But He cares more about people than He cares about pigs. An ethic in the New Testament, an ethic in the Bible as a whole, is that people are not possessions. People are not a commodity. People are not to be used. People are not for profit. But the townsfolk thought otherwise because livestock had been lost. Pigs, which were a commodity worth money, had been wasted. So what if these men were set free spiritually? A herd of expensive pigs had been wasted and the whole community went out to meet with Jesus for what? To plead with them to leave the region. Why? I suppose because He was costing them money. He, the demons were successful. They had stirred up strife And so the whole community comes out to plead with Jesus to leave the region. And why? Because they loved possessions. And He had cost them some of their possessions. He had cost the community money. And this is one reason why people don't engage more deeply with Jesus. Because it will cost you possessions. This is, this is a reason why, people, why some people don't engage more deeply in the church. Because it costs you. It costs you time. It costs you money. It costs you 
relational capital. You have to risk relationally. Our lack of generous hearts can intuitively keep us at arm's length from the church because God is calling you to be generous. And if you don't have a generous heart, then you are at odds with Jesus. And following Jesus will cost you a lot more than your money. But for some reason, it often starts there. Okay, what is the main storyline woven through both of these stories, both of these pericopes? The main storyline is the authority of Jesus. Jesus' rule. Jesus' reign. The divinity, the godness of Jesus. He is revealing Himself in a new light. And it's controversial. It is divisive. Jesus is polarizing. There are too many other things that we, the church, bring into the conversation that, that are polarizing issues. But if we, would, if we would just, for the moment, just clear the table of all the secondary polarizing issues on the table, Jesus is still on the table. Jesus Himself is polarizing. Because He calls us to a deep level of devotion and a high level of faith. Jesus has always been polarizing. Jesus to this day is polarizing. And there are two issues that are polarizing in these two pericopes. The first is this. Is Jesus powerful in my life, in the storm, on the boat, when the waves are raging. I think you understand I'm speaking metaphorically now in your life. On the boat, when the waves are going over the bow of the boat, that's the front of the boat, when they're going over the bow of the boat, and, and, and we're taking on water, is Jesus powerful in my life, or is life just random? That is the one big issue in, this, in these two stories. And the second big issue, is my life focused on people at this moment, if you just took a snapshot, not last year, not like you got a good record, but like right now, today, snapshot in time, is my life focused on people or is my life focused on possessions? Still Still, though, what is really on display here, I repeat this, what is really on display here is the power and the, thor and the authority of Jesus. Not, not my weakness, because Jesus will overcome my weakness if I lean into Jesus. What's on display here is not my weakness. You see, if in my weakness I'm able to connect with the power and the authority of Jesus, would that not be eternally life-changing? Let me say that again. If in our weaknesses we are able to connect to the power and authority of Jesus, would that not be eternally life-changing? I'm going to review some of the high points of the story and I'm going to give you an action plan briefly and we'll be done. Here's the review. Jesus is the incarnate God. He is completely God. The demons know it. They call Him God. The disciples haven't quite decided yet. But, but he's, he's the incarnate God. Some more, some more interesting summary statements. Jesus is exhausted sleeping on a boat ride that would normally only take an hour or two. I find that very interesting. Another summary. Jesus' restfulness on the boat 
in the midst of the storm is quite the contrast to the disciples' anxiety. It, 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 highlights, it highlights, in almost a humorous way, his total control of the situation at any given time. He's exhausted. He sleeps like a baby because he knows that though he's exhausted, he is in total control. A few more observations. The seas, the seas obey Jesus. Next, demons obey Jesus. I'm not naive to the fact that there are some of us in this room today that are struggling in the spiritual realm. Jesus has command over the demons. At the name of Jesus, they shudder. Another statement. Demons want nothing to do with the Son of God. They have no power over Him. They have no authority to rival His majesty. If you want the demons to flee, lean hard into Jesus. Last statement. The liberation of these two men took precedent over the monetary cost, <clears throat> the economic disadvantage that it would bring, and even the humane treatment of pigs. These men, the, the liberation of these two men took precedent over all of that because Jesus is about people, lost sheep, as he refers to them. And he calls us to be about people as well. Action steps, and we're done. Here's what I call you to today. Number one, I call you to pray concerned prayers today, this week. I had a faithless fear on my mind in Juneau, Alaska, the last day or two I was there because I was coming home and I had this problem on my mind. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm personally embarrassed. I'm not saying like I'm telling you and I'm embarrassed to tell you. Like I'm, I'm personally disappointed that, that, that I spent like days, I came home and like days, days, I did not think this to be a matter that I, that I ought to pray about. Or I just chose not to. But for days, I, I worked it out of my brain and I, 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 I worked it out on my laptop and I, 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 I fretted over it. And so I call myself as well, pray concerned prayers. They beat faithless fears any day. Fear is your enemy. Fight it. Run away from it. Resist it. Wage war against it. Fear is your enemy. Pray Concerned prayers. Number two, look beyond the surface for the deeper meaning to your circumstances. What I mean by that is you can focus on the storm. You can focus on the storm. Or you can consider what the outcome might be. And you can pray for the outcome and you can look forward to the outcome. I've said this before. I tend to say this more and more uh, to, to younger people as I get older and older. I say this, hear me, and this is really good for all of you, but it's especially good if you're, if you're younger than me. Your greatest problems today, in a few years, won't matter at all. God, Jesus, He cares about your circumstances. But He cares way more about your heart. 
in your circumstances, if this isn't just a random roller coaster ride, if, if life is purposeful, then your circumstances are purpose built to shape your heart. Jesus cares about your circumstances. Back in verse 16, every, every person that was broken, every person that was sick, he was healing. He cares much about your circumstances, but just rest in the fact that he cares even more about your heart for eternity. He's doing something in you in the midst of your circumstances. Number three, guard against Satan's attempts to bring chaos into your life. Just know, people, that when you are at odds with somebody else, they're not your enemy. <clears throat> Paul, in, in, in the last chapter of Ephesians, he tells us, we wage war, but not against flesh and blood. Your enemy, you have an enemy, but he's, he's not who you think he is. Guard against Satan's attempts to bring chaos in your life. When you see chaos and you want to punch somebody in the face or somebody's coming hard at you, I want you to have an aha moment and go, oh, I see what's going on here. This chaos is born out of a, a much, much deeper source than I realized. Brother, you, you're not my enemy. Sister, you're not my enemy. I, this isn't about... This, this chaos, it, it comes from a much, much darker order. Guard against Satan's attempts to bring chaos into your life. Last action step. I, I, try, to, I try to wake up every morning and, and, and say this, and, and I, I fail sometime every day. And then the next morning, I try and remind myself this again. Life's about people. Life's about relationship. Man, I love my possessions. I, 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 I sometimes love my possessions too much. I struggle with this. You struggle with this. We wake up every morning, and we remind ourselves, I'm going to choose people today, not possessions. Life is about people. It's, 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 it's not about my agenda it's, it's, it, it, it's not about the task I have today, not ultimately. It's, it's, it's not about mostly being right because all of those agendas get in the way of people. Life is about people. Choose people over possessions. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. If you would just bow right where you are and in the quietness of the moment, you do your dealing with Jesus. Would you just pray silently for just a few seconds, not out loud, if you would just pray silently. Maybe the Lord spoke to you in some way. Just speak to Him right now. celebrate we celebrate your power and authority over all of creation and God we want to lean hard today into your power and authority over our lives individually our circumstances we mostly believe that God we struggle with this but then we remind ourselves we say yes Yes and amen. This is true. Life's not random. Our circumstances are purpose-built for our redemption, our sanctification. We lean hard into that. God, we, we celebrate you today. You, long ago, before the creation of, of the world, you determined to send your son as an agent 
saving, an agent for saving grace, a, a sacrifice for our sins. Long ago, you cleared the highest hurdle that's ever been cleared. You said, yes, I will send my son to save the world. We celebrate you, God the Father. God the Son, Jesus Christ, we celebrate you. You are the God-man. You, you are without beginning, without end. You are eternal. You are, you are a, a member of the Godhead. We celebrate you, Jesus, today. You, we celebrate you because you, you, you were obedient to the will of the Father. You humbled yourself. You came to the earth. You became a servant on our behalf, and you went to the cross for our forgiveness. You, you were obedient to the Father. We celebrate you, Jesus, the Son of God. And God, the Holy Spirit, we, we celebrate you today. Holy Spirit, you are, you are welcome here. You are, your, your power and your presence gives us life, gives us the, the, the power of right living. We, we welcome you here today, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the, the Holy Spirit, we pray to you today. We, we celebrate you today. We, we welcome you here today. This is all about you. This is all for you. This is all because of you.